Good evening, everyone. I'm Kat Quinna, I'm the Associate Dean here, and I've been working with the Urban Initiative for the past three years, and we are delighted that you've joined us here tonight. This is our third community forum and our fourth major speaking event of the year. We have one more on May 14th. You may have seen the flyers out there. Um, and actually, the, the May 14th is a double header with an invited speaker and a community forum. Um, we have branded this year, I hate that term branding, but <laughs> that's basically what we've done. We discovered that the city of Providence wasn't always aware that they had a university in their midst, <laughs> and the university wasn't always aware that we had a, sit a city surrounding us. And we hope to bridge that gap with a whole year of not only uh, wonderful community forums and speakers, but also we've had our urban arts and culture program with exhibits, um, musical, uh, theatrical, other events. And I hope that you'll have an opportunity, if not tonight, at some point in the future, to check out the current um, exhibit, our urban uh, wildlife exhibit, and our wonderful gardens that we're growing in the building. Um, that said, I would like to introduce to you first the Vice Provost for Urban Affairs of the University of Rhode Island, Dr. John McRae. Thank you, Kat. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. That's right. I'm talking here to either urbanites, wannabe urbanites, are those with urbanite envy. <laughs> uh, this is beautiful, and, and uh, I want to welcome you to the university's urban campus. The university, as some of you know, is a tri-grant institution, a land grant, which was the historical campus located in Kingston, uh, the sea grant, or ocean grant, which is located in Narragansett, and the urban grant location, which is here as in fact it should be. And I would like to uh, not only welcome you, as Kat has already done, to many of the programs that we have here in the ambiance. If you look around, this is the ambiance of an urban campus. I even have organized graffiti going up back there. <laughs> Sometimes I have some unorganized graffiti. But in either case, some of these people are very good. Uh, this, is, this is the environment in which we live in. It is the environment in which we raise our families and the environment in which we learn to live with each other. Uh, this uh, program is very important to us, and it's uh, so refreshing for me to see all the uh, great faces here, those who come eagerly to learn. I mean, that's what, uh, what the uh, school is about. I want to also um, introduce you to my friend and colleague, Mr. Marshall Feldman. Marshall? And I guess uh, Kat will introduce you to Mark and Paul a little later on. But welcome. Make yourself at home here. Uh, on the second floor, you know, I have uh, also a very large art uh, gallery. That art gallery is made uh, uh, of productions from students from the K-12 through system in Rhode Island. In fact, uh, very short story. May I give a short story? Thank you. I will give a short story because I'm Baptist. Uh, that, that art gallery... <laughs> That art gallery is actually found in the basement of the State Department, and it was molding. <laughs> and we went in and we brought it out because it was uh, art that was put up and produced by young people in the K-12 through system. Initially, of course, the mold started affecting my workers. I thought they were doing other things, but that's all right. So we had to take it down and clean it. But if you go on the second floor, you'll see uh, every year we add to that with uh, the help of the Rhode Island Arts Society, who uh, conducts a contest of some of the people who are going on there. And I have to tell you, some of that art, in, uh, in, my, in my opinion, is actually world caliber art for people that size. That's, that's the type of people that live in these urban areas. And I think that's what you're going to find uh, when you listen to our four excellent people who are going to explain to you how we do it in the urban area. I mean, we are the savior of the state. We ought to be saying, savior of the state, urbanites, urbanites. <laughs> so, We'll go to the State Department and do something like that. In either case, uh, I'm beginning to ramble. Uh, welcome once again. 
I hope you will find this very enjoyable, and we're going to continue this as long as we can, at least as long as I'm here. Thank you very much. And I should mention that this program, like the others, is uh, also supported by a state legislative uh, block grant uh, to the University of Rhode Island for, for the urban uh, initiative, for which we are very grateful. Uh, in addition to Marshall, whom you've just met, Paul Florin has been very active in this group. And over there, Tammy Vargas Warner. Tammy Vargas Warner is responsible for making sure that all of this stuff happened, and she did this while she's also a full-time now advisor and uh, in a PhD program. So <laughs> she's done a lot. Um, but this would not be possible without uh, actually Paul Florin connecting us to Mark Levitt. So it is also my honor tonight to introduce you to Mark Levitt. I could do the 20-minute version, but I'm told we have other speakers on the, the panel, so <laughs> this is an exciting panel. Mark is a storyteller. He's a radio uh, talk show host. He has uh, developed some wonderful performances, one of which is just about to be performed in Kingston, or did it already? It's in October again. In October again, um, called Triple Decker. We did it here this year. Um, Mark has been coordinating these and it has been well worth uh, that moment when Paul said, hey, there's this guy I met that you really should meet. So we are very grateful and I'm going to turn it over to Mark rather than giving the long introduction and he will introduce you to our wonderful panel. And thank you all of you for coming tonight. All right. Thank you, Kat, and thank all of you for making this uh, possible for me to all of a sudden immerse myself in the world of urbanism. And not that I haven't. Growing up in New York City, I had experiential knowledge, but very little theoretical knowledge. So it's a pleasure to have that excuse to start to read about it and to talk with such wonderful guests as you'll um, you'll meet in a little while. Um, before we do anything, I'd like to just, <clears throat> if we can, take a moment of silence, just an acknowledgement of what happened in uh, uh, Boston one week ago today. Thank you. Well, let me give you the... Um, the lay of the land, the ground rules, the uh, way in which we're going to proceed. We have four uh, exceptionally wonderful and talented and um, exciting speakers to listen to. So we're going to take a little break from how I normally work with panels with uh, um, wonderful people as well by just simply starting an interview process. I'm going to have each one of them uh, show you some slides and talk about something to do with this topic that we created as a group, and we called it the 21st Century City, Integrating Diversity, Culture, and Infrastructure. Because we all, all of us connected to the panel, realize that the world was a different place than it certainly was when I was growing up, when answers were simple, seemingly, and where uh, we didn't do much thinking about global uh, climate change. And we didn't do much thinking about how to create neighborhoods because they were there. And we didn't do much thinking about diversity, and that was our fault. And we realized that it was time to give all of us an opportunity to see the rest of the world's attempt to wrestle with these various issues. And to give us here in Rhode Island language, visuals, to stimulate our imagination about how a city in the 21st century can integrate all those elements that I talked about. There's nothing more exciting than to realize that the community that you're in is on the cutting edge. And we live in a city where we actually moved bridges, where we actually created one of the greatest public art projects probably in the United States' history, in my opinion, which is water fire. And we've created 
a place filled with the wealth of artistic, creative, thinking people. But there's still a long way to go. And one of the reasons we all decided to get together in this process is to help us take the next step to help us envision how we could create a city of the 21st century that acknowledges all the difficulties, all the issues, and all the potentialities of urban America. And so what we'll do is each of the four speakers will show you some slides for about, oh, eight or nine minutes. We'll sit down at that table and move it right out into the center. We'll talk for a little bit amongst ourselves, but then it's up to you. Because everybody who's seen me work knows what I'm going to say next. You can't leave here telling your friends that you wish I would have talked about something else. You can't leave here saying that I wish such and such would have said this or that or that I disagreed with it because from the moment you walk in here, you are now co-creators of this form. So do I have a promise that you are going to be involved? Yes. Oh boy, oh you're great. Can I bring you every form I have? I love that, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> So, okay, so the first person I'm going to introduce, and, and, and I have to, to tell you this, I've known for about 43, 44 years, and we were friends at college together. And we lost touch and then got back into touch, and it turns out that our interests are quite convergent in a lot of different ways. And so it's my pleasure to introduce you now to Janet Zweig, who is from, not originally, but lives now in Brooklyn, New York, Anybody know that place? And uh, she's a Brooklyn-based artist whose awards include the Rome Prize Fellowship and residencies at PS1 in New York City, or Queens, New York, and at the McDowell Colony. She works primary, primarily in the public realm. Her sculpture and books have been exhibited widely, including at the Brooklyn Museum of Art, the Walker Art Center, and Cooper Union. She teaches at the Rhode Island School of Design and at uh, Brown University. Could you welcome Janet Zweig? Thank you so much, Mark, for inviting me to this. Um, let me just get my PowerPoint going. Tammy, what shall I do? Escape. Okay. I need your help. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, again, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm gonna try to do two things in my eight or nine minutes. Um, I want to um, uh, raise a question about what we think public art is for in the 21st century city. Um, and I wanna raise that question by looking at a particular trajectory of thinking that began in the 1980s. Um, since I'm kind of baffled by this question, I am hoping that we can have a conversation about it. Um, and then after that, as requested by Mark, I'm gonna show you some, just a little bit of my own work in the public realm. So I'm sure many of you know about this, but there was a pivotal event in the discussion of public art in the 1980s, and that was the destruction of the sculptor Richard Serra's piece, Tilted Ark, which was, um, uh, commissioned by a government agency, a federal agency, the General Services Administration, prior to 1981 when it was installed. Um, after it was installed, there was a lot of public um, objection to it, and there was a lot of public support for it. Um, so the GSA held a hearing. The hearing is, is um, in, uh, you can watch it as a film, it's called The Trial of Tilted Ark, and I'm gonna show you just a few seconds worth of it. Um, it was not really a legal proceeding, but it was an opportunity to people, for people to vent about this sculpture. Most of you know Richard Serra's sculpture, big steel sculptures. Um, he made a piece on this federal plaza, and um, this, was the convert, this was a little piece of the conversation about it at that public hearing. Um, this is what the critic and art historian Douglas Crimp said. 
after it had, been, it had been stated that tilted arc, the sculpture, interfered with the functioning of the plaza. Um, and I also want to tell you that I, you know, I extracted this little bit from the movie, and every time I watch it, I show it to my students the whole movie, and I always come to this little bit because I think it's really interesting when you think about how public art has changed since the 1980s. So let me try to play this. It's a little hard to hear, so I can play, it's just a few seconds. I can play it a second time if you can't hear it. Let's see. Oops, no, that wasn't what I meant to do. Um, Tammy, I need your help. <laughs> Let's see. How do I go back and forward? Back. I need Tammy all the time. Okay. Beginning. Okay. So let's just play that. And then forward. That art might play in our lives. Rather than appearing to me by an argument administrator, it seems to believe that art and social function are incredible. That art has no social function. What makes me feel manipulated is that I am forced to argue for art as against some other social function. I'm asked to line up on the side of sculpture against, say, those who are on the side of concerts, or maybe picnic tables. Could you hear that? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so, these comments could be interpreted in two ways, and they could be understood as I understand them, I don't know if you do, to mean that art has an independent social function that's valuable in itself. Perhaps it could be a number of things. Perhaps it's the generating of critical thought, as some people say. But, it, but um, let's say a social function that's independent of other social functions. Um, however, it seems to be, have been understood after Tilted Arc was taken down, um, it seems to have been understood by very fearful and earnest state agencies after it, the, it was removed that controversy should be avoided at all costs in cities. Um, and that public art should be attached to other civic functions, that it should, as they say, been, be instrumentalized. Um, so over the next many years, um, 350 to 400 percent for art agencies are, are now um, uh, making public art in cities uh, through a percent for art ordinances. And um, those cities put out what are called RFQs, requests for qualifications for artists to participate, to make something for them. Um, and here are some examples of those RFQs. Um, for instance, you can just read the, the yellow part. For the instance, this one says that the art should educate pe the public on environmental issues, engage, and then just kind of write out says the potential the potential to draw other investment into the area. In other words, make money for our city with your art. Um, this one, these two um, seem to want to transform some buildings. I'll let you read them. Uh, these two RFQs seem to want to slow down traffic <laughs> with art. Or to improve traffic flow. Why not? Maybe slow down and look, I guess. Um, this one has a kind of double purpose, a, a sort of ethical and um, spatial purpose. Glad you find them amusing, because I do too. Um, now, there's, here's a final one. This one is just... Um, uh, Pretty, pretty boldly stating that they want the art to be industrial design. Um, now, I, I want to add here that, well, I, first I want to say that in a way these agencies are asking too much, you know, that we should add dignity to a, a public building or calm traffic, but in another way they're asking, I think, far too little of art. Um, I want to add that I've contributed to this direction. I'm currently helping a city in Washington State write a master plan for arts and culture. 
Um, but I have to admit, just secretly, just between you and me, that um, I sometimes feel like um, I'm helping a very creative art administrator come up with an alibi for art. Um, and then I've also uh, made public art for um, cities with these kinds of requirements. For instance, I made a piece in Milwaukee on the streetscape of Milwaukee. The purpose was to improve pedest the pedestrian experience. So I made um, pieces that were on uh, five lamp poles along the street that engaged pedestrians. Um, this was the part of the RFQ for that. And um, finally, in this part of this question that I'm raising about what art, what public art should do for cities, I want to show you some hate mail I got during the process of this um, this particular project in Milwaukee. Um, uh, the, the project um, between, what often happens with public art is between the making of the art and, and the installing of it, there gets, it gets some publicity and the amount of money is advertised. And um, there was a misconception that the money was coming from taxpayers in Milwaukee or, or even Wisconsin, which it wasn't. And this got caught up in right-wing radio. And um, uh, there was a kind of controversy and a whole lot of Milwaukee artists marched to City Hall and demanded that the project be made, which is kind of embarrassing for me. But in that period, I received this email, which kind of shocked me, from someone named Happy Day. Um, and first he quoted some comments in the newspaper, and then the yellow part is his own voice. He says, public transportation may be funding the majority of your art, in quotes, but it could without doubt be used for safety of its riders. Do you really believe your pictures are going to stop people in Milwaukee from beating and shooting at each other on our bus lines? You money-grubbing artist, this really took me aback when I got it. Take some of your profits and really give back to the city that paid your, he kind of made up an, a word here, but I think he meant exorbitant, but I, I love it, exurbanite fees. Go walk our ghettos and clear your conscience. Now, I, my first reaction was to be just horrified, you know, and because I want to please people, and then I read it and read it, and it really made me think because I really don't believe my art is going to stop people from beating and shooting at each other. And um, so I didn't have to walk the ghetto and clear my conscience. But, um, but it did make me think about, well, what is public art for? You know, what do people expect from public art? What do people expect from art? Because people always have a strong reaction to it. So that's something that I want to bring up to the panel and ask the panel. Oh, okay. So now I'm going to quickly show you um, two pieces that I made that kind of play into this discussion. Um, both coincidentally in the state of Missouri, one in St. Louis and one in um, uh, Kansas City. Um, I was asked to, I was commissioned to make a piece for a light rail station in um, St. Louis at a um, an area of St. Louis called Maplewood. It was an area that was kind of a depressed area um, and uh, kind of had been in decline for a little while, since the 60s. Um, it was a, and I, I'm showing you this because the people that I met there, a lot of them asked me, could you, you know, we don't, we don't have an identity. People don't know where we are. Um, and I was, you know, bridling against this because I didn't want to do a gateway or an identity piece. But they were so nice and they wanted it so much and they kind of needed an, an, needed something like this. So I, I thought, how can I do this with a twist? Um, they had a marquee, that's what this is, from an old, um, that said Maplewood, from an old uh, theater. And they wanted me to put it up. And I said, well, I can't put that up, but I can do something else for you. So I turned my focus from the light rail station to the overpass that you, where you enter Maplewood. Um, and I also noticed that there were some Everyone who lived there lived in little tiny houses, and there were a couple of them that the city were t was taking down. Um, these two, um, both houses of hoarders, as it turned out. So um, I asked them if I could salvage materials from these two houses, and they said yes, and they shipped them t to my fabricator. Um, and I made this piece for them, um, a sign that says Maplewood. It's um, two signs, one made out of the pieces from the houses. One side is backwards, so that when you uh, drive in from the other side, you, you pass, you see the other si sign on that side, and you see this si sign in at, when you stop at the, head, at the street light in your rear view mirror. 
um, sort of looking at the past of Maplewood. And this is, these are close-ups of the pieces. Um, and it's lit at night. And on the other side, where they, they said they wanted, you know, I asked them how they wanted it, the people who I was working with in Maplewood, and they said they wanted the new sign, the refurbished sign, sorry, on the side where the wealthy suburbs were. So people coming from the wealthy suburbs would see this refurbished Maplewood. So we renovated these houses, you know, renovated, and we painted the bathrooms and the walls and retiled the bathrooms, as it were, and this is the sign on that side. <coughs> And there it is at night. Now, what's, what was interesting to me about this was that, oh, I'm sorry, there's a little plaque, two little plaques with the houses that they were, um, the pieces were taken from, and a quote from Marshall McLuhan that you'll see in a minute. The interesting part to me was when we were putting these up, and this is putting up the, the forward sign, but when we were putting up the backward sign, we had two lanes closed and two lanes open, and people were snapping pictures with their cell phones. And... Um, uh, shouting at the installers, you're putting your sign up backwards. <laughs> and, um, and then this wonderful local Fox News, this is local Fox News, this guy is saying, um, I'm here at the Maplewood Manchester overpass and there's something here that's turning heads. Yes, it's backwards, but there's a reason. And then they go to the studio and everything in the studio is backwards and forwards and you know, they have this Marshall McLuhan quote. <laughs> We drive into the future using only our rearview mirror. So, so it gave Maplewood the attention that they wanted, which I, I was very pleased because I really loved the people I was working with there. And then quickly, I'm going to tell you about this other piece, one other piece. Can I, do I have time for this? Okay, so in Kansas City, I got a commission to make um, a piece on a rooftop of a parking garage in downtown Kansas City. Um, that's the parking garage, the white with the little dots on it. Uh, it's six stories high, um, and on top of it is a green roof. And when we first went up there, it was, had a kind of lawn and some sedum in it. It's a public space, a very large, almost an acre public space of a green roof, but nobody was going up there. It's, you could go up in the elevator and just be out there, but it was kind of desolate. So I collaborated with a, some wonderful architects, El Dorado architects, and this is the installing of our boxcar. We, we installed a prairie and a boxcar on the roof. Um, and this is the installing of it. We used real boxcar wheels and track, and then we built this perforated boxcar. Um, the prairie really transformed. It's just growing in this picture, but it really transformed the space. This is it closed on the roof. And, but the important aspect of it is that when the door is opened, it's a proscenium stage, and um, it's... Part of our commission, we used to hire a curator, a performance curator. So there's, um, there are performances of all kinds that are going to be educational events, and I'll just click through. So this feels to me sort of like, a, you know, a little uncharacteristic of most of my work, but it feels like some kind of placemaking. We'll see what happens. Um, people seem to love the space, so... Um, the space seems to have been transformed at least. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jan. It's amazing how people change at college. She got a football scholarship. <laughs> Went into a completely different line of work. It was, <laughs> thank you, it was great. I'm glad you put your own work there. She doesn't want to do that, she says, but I'm happy you did that. Um, speaking of sports, my, uh, our next guest was uh, almost in the 1984 Olympics as a swimmer. You're looking to see who it is, aren't you? <laughs> and uh, uh, he is a uh, martial artist. Uh, used to be a martial artist, right? Now he just wrestles with planning issues. Uh, really, we're lucky in Rhode Island to have a, a wonderful, wonderful, uh, and I've known now this for about two weeks from my conversations with him, a new planning director who's innovative and interesting and um, diverse in his interests and uh, in his interests in urbanism. And he's been kind enough, and we were lucky to call him before he got here because if I had called him once he got here, he'd never have the time to be here. 
but he's a, a, a man of his commitments. It's Ruben Flores Marzan, and he was appointed the Director of Planning and Development for the City of Providence by uh, Mayor Tavares in January uh, 2013. Prior to his appointment in Providence, he was the Planning Director for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. There, his stewardship generated a period of extraordinary growth, totaling over 3.1 billion in development. We could use a little of that here. While including renewable energy products and the creation of a 9,000 acre plus uh, um, acre, 9,000 plus acre environmental reserve. It's my pleasure to introduce you now to Ruben Flores Marzan. Thank you so much. And welcome to the city of Providence. <laughs> Good evening. Yeah, I think we're going to start with a little bit of music uh, to give us a perspective regarding what I will be talking about. Um, this is a bomba and plena music during the Loisa uh, Village Festival, which occurs uh, during the summer in Loisa. Loisa is an African Puerto Rican uh, community, um, a municipality uh, next to the airport. For those of you who have been to Puerto Rico, it's on the eastern side of the airport. Uh, it's a place where it doesn't, it doesn't really have that much development, but the development that occurs there is culturally related and um, they celebrate space and place with their music, their dances, their costumes and the whole nine yards. So this is a little bit regarding that particular video. I hope you enjoy it. So you get the point. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. So. so the topic of my um, thesis tonight, it's regarding culture and place as pillars for sustainable community uh, recovery. Um, we like to celebrate. We're human beings. We are gregarious. And uh, when we go to a particular place, besides the architecture, the design, uh, the shops and restaurants or whatever, we just like to have a great time. And in my particular experience, the way of having a great time, and this is in terms of working and in visiting different places throughout the globe, um, it usually takes a couple of things. It takes uh, joyful happiness, uh, people, with the right attitude to have a great time. A uh, little bit of drinking, a little bit of eating, uh, music and dance uh, always helps. Um, so in this particular presentation, I'll be talking about a little bit of regarding Bomba and Plena Festival in Loisa Village 
and the San Sebastián Street uh, Festival, uh, more commonly known in Puerto Rico as Sanse, which occurs in the old city of San Juan during the month of January each year. This is a particular logo of, uh, of the Bomba Festival in Loiza. Um, you see all the colors. When you take a look at this, you know there's some action going on here. This is fun. Um, the Loiza Village, uh, like I said before, um, it's a community, small community, African, Puerto Rican community. They really embrace their African roots uh, and they make uh, sound uh, business sense from that point in exporting and making their culture known to others, others in the island as, uh, as well as abroad. Um, we see here a painting of some uh, conga and bomba players on the uh, upper left hand side and we have the costumes and we have the people walking around in the festival. Um, this is a family affair. Uh, people uh, in families in Loisa Village um, basically have done this for decades. This is their lifestyle. This is like their day job, actually. Um, they learn how to uh, work the skins for the, for the drums, the costumes, the choreography, the song, the dance, the eating, uh, the particular dynamics that occur for a festival to be a joyful experience for, for others that are outside and not, are not familiar with the situation. Uh, so we have a kid here playing the drums. We have a little girl doing the dancing as well as a boy, a teenage girl rehearsing uh, the dancing in front of the guys playing the, the drums. And then the black and white is from the early 80s, uh, a, an ensemble of, of bomba players uh, in Loisa. Um, there are some distinct families that have been doing this for a long time. The, the most known are the Ayala uh, family, the Ayala brothers, Hermanos Ayala. Uh, they basically have gone the world over traveling and taking their bomba and plena shows that are played in Spain, Japan, uh, Europe, uh, throughout the world, really. So when you take a look at this, um, it's more than just Loisa, it's about exporting knowledge, exporting the experience, uh, and, and basically gathering followers that either follow them to Loisa or to wherever they're playing for. Um, there's some scholarly research regarding um, uh, Bomba and Plena. This is a, uh, a, a, a clip from the Smithsonian Institution, uh, and it gives you a synopsis regarding what Bomba is. And you know, for purposes of, of scholarly research, uh, it's a great thing. You know, knowledge is power, and in this particular case, culture and tradition are drivers of that particular community development, um, life skills. Also, like I say, uh, bomba families—they're micro businesses in themselves. Uh, so they're creating jobs. They're also helping out their communities by enriching their culture and enabling within that for people to come over and maintain that bomba and plena legacy. So this is the other festival that I was telling you about and I will share with you a, another video regarding uh, the San Sebastian Street Festival. Uh, last year, actually this year, this January, um, we had San Sebastian 2013. Uh, and during the four days of the celebration, uh, San, all San Juan uh, had uh, approximately 500,000 people visiting. Uh, and that's huge in terms of you know, jobs created, capital coming into the city, and the fun. So let me play the video for you. This is the actual uh, Bank of America Bank, which is the biggest bank in Puerto Rico. So there's also a, a sector of the whole process. They basically invest money to bring in their clients to the, to the festival. They drive the, the clients to the festival. They don't have to drive. And they escort them throughout the whole activity. And in the, during that happening, they're basically getting bombarded, so to speak, with 
advertise regarding the goods and the services provided by the bank. So it's within the context of the, of the festival, they get their point across in terms of marketing and all that. These are the promoters of the bank, you know, with the banners and the whole thing. These are all private dollars. No, no public dollars here. These guys, the players and the artists and everything, uh, they were hired by the bank. The bank pays for that. Look at that whole bunch of people there. And they're getting exposed to what Banco Popular is. And Echar Palante is basically carry on. You know, get going. So, let's see. So the San Sebastián Festival, Sanse, it's uh, occurs for four days in January, and it brings a whole bunch of people there, approximately five hundred thousand, like I said. Uh, it's a festival. It used to be, well, in its uh, Genesis, it was a uh, religious uh, festivity, but obviously, you know, 21st century, we're just there to have a great time, to party, to buy stuff, drink, eat, and just mingle with um, with people from Puerto Rico and from abroad. Uh, you see on the um, on the side of the building the bunch of paintings that the artists and the uh, different guys go and sell stuff. So um, there are micro businesses here, besides the artists. We have the, um, you see the girls with the dresses. They actually uh, would have um, people f accompanying them. So if somebody uh, addresses them regarding how beautiful is a the dress, they say, well, I can do it for you too. You know? So they will give you the, a card with their name and you know, their email address and whatever and set up an interview so you can get basically a similar dress if you wanted to. And we also have, you know, the, the culinary uh, prowess of uh, Puerto Rican street uh, cuisine. These are uh, pork kebabs surrounded by uh, uh, plantains, fried, fried plantains. So besides drinking, dancing, you know, you need to eat something if you want to last. Um, like I said, Sanse, it's the ideal place for multinational corporations, just like Banco, Banco Popular. Then we have here on our right hand side, Bacardi. So there's a Bacardi component to the whole thing, obviously. Uh, and we party hard, it says on the ad. Uh, the smaller uh, frame on the upper left hand side, it's uh, AT&T. So AT&T also announces their services. And then on the uh, upper, the lower left hand side, we have the Coors people, the Coors beer. So, you know, everybody, uses the experience to drive their message across. Um, even people interested in advocacy. Um, the girl with the black shirt, basically she's addressing the problem in Puerto Rico of, of stray pets. So it says, todos somos satos. Satos is uh, straight uh, in Spanish. So, um, then we have the advocacy, obviously, the, the mime. He cannot talk, but you know, it's part of the, of the whole thing. Um, and then you see a snap picture here, a combined picture of a daily uh, occurrence during Sanse. That probably was on a uh, either Friday early evening. So you can see the people like getting off work and just flogging, going to San Juan uh, to have a great time. With the advent of the uh, internet, uh, we see that uh, some jurisdictions and Puerto Rican communities are also celebrating Sanse in their own particular way. This is an ad from uh, a restaurant in, Maya, in Wynwood, Florida, Fiesta de la Calle San Sebastián. So they're basically saying, come on over, draw in San Sebastián, and you'll get to experience Sanse here in Florida. So you experience it through food, through music, through dance, and you don't have to be in Puerto Rico for that. This is a bunch of guys during Sanse, and basically the, the, the banner, the, the sign that they're carrying, it says, better, better be here and experience it here than through Facebook. 
So, you know, you get the, the point of saying, hey, you can watch all you want in Facebook, you know, but it doesn't compare to the actual experience of being here and walking the streets and being here at three in the morning and the guys banging on your face, you know, the drums and the drinking. And so it's, a, it's an experience. Uh, and, you know, we only have one life to live. So, if, you know, if you want to do that at three in the morning, this is a place to be. So what are the common themes uh, from Sangse and, and, and the Loisa Village uh, Festival? Uh, both events have grown in importance and support uh, over time thanks to the local communities. In the case of Loisa, it's the actual uh, neighborhoods and the people that live in those neighborhoods after the festival is over and how they get together and they plan for the next year to make it better. The same thing in the old San Juan uh, community. You know, people that have lived in old San Juan for decades and then the new artists coming in and say, okay, how can we get it and make it better? Um, and you know, that is important. For instance, um, unfortunately during Sangse uh, 2013, there was a fatality, but it was related to, to drugs. Uh, somebody shot somebody. Uh, so, you know, next year, Sunset 2014, they're going to have to really address, you know, how to maintain safety uh, and ensure that people still enjoy the, the event. Um, in terms of place, uh, the venues, Loisa, it's a coastal village, and then Old San Juan is an old Spanish colonial city. And the combination of place and the stimuli we're talking about, dancing the process, the combination of that is what enables us to express ourselves during these festivities. And by expressing ourselves, we become part of that culture and we embrace a culture so people down the road understand how it is important to maintain that culture and moving forward and just um, ensure that people that are coming in, they feel part of it. Uh, so it's a learning process. Uh, as I said before, neighborhood leadership is what makes this thing uh, continue over and over each year. Uh, but they also need private sector sponsorships. That's why you say Sprint, Banco Popular, all these major players contributing in their own particular way. But you still don't lose the essence of what the festival is about. Uh, and that is very important for these festivals to continue. Um, in my experience, and you know, as a, as a Puerto Rican, born and raised in Puerto Rico, and then going abroad uh, for work and, and school and, and travel, it's about being there. It's about you know sharing that space with the locals and being part of their culture and, and, and embracing the experience. Um, I think that's very necessary, and, and I think uh, that stands to be uh, a continuous economic development model. Uh, for places like Providence, for instance. Um, and in the end, I mean, these are all value propositions in terms of business, in terms of culture, in terms of uh, maintaining our sense of place. So, um, you know, what I would say is that we need to have activities like this more often and be, um, be open to the possibilities at those rings in terms of place making, in terms of sharing our culture and in terms of uh, uh, making our places and for them to continue being unique places. And that's pretty much all I have. So thank you. Gracias. I didn't tell you that once he got out of the martial arts, he became a bomba dancer. <laughs> I was in Louisa. I was in the Merchant Marines in 1969 in the summer, and I went to Louisa, and I can't tell you I remember anything. <laughs> um, the, <laughs> the next panelist is uh, Laura Briggs, and she's another one who's come up. You've moved up here, haven't you? So we give her a nice round of applause for moving from New York City to Rhode Island. 
and she's a visiting professor at the Rhode Island School of Design and, the, uh, and was the chair of sustainable architecture research at Parsons, the new school for design in New York. With Alice Min Su Chun, she won the Bruner Grant from the Architectural Foundation of New York for the Third Skin, an adaptable building system that both saves and generates energy. Her work has been featured in uh, the New York Times. Could you welcome, please, and welcome to Providence, Laura Briggs. Thank you, Laura. get it full screen, does it matter? View. Uh, sorry. Full screen mode. There we go. Sorry, it's, I'm used to Macs. Um, okay, I'm gonna talk to you about a project, about a single house, but also uh, about how that house fits within a community. Um, I'm going to describe to you uh, this, uh, uh, that the project was part of a, a four-year um, process with Parsons, the New School of Design, uh, Milano, the New School for Urban Policy, at, um, and also Stevens Institute of Technology, which is an engineering school. Um, we got together in order to build a house for what's the Department of Energy's Solar Decathlon, which is a biannual exhibition that the Department of Energy puts on to design and build the most um, cutting edge solar homes. So, um, uh, but our team took a different tact than most of the teams while working on that competition. We decided that really the problem for sustainability is a social problem, not really a technical problem. And so we um, decided that we needed to engage a community. And um, in doing that, just before I go into that project, I wanted to step back a minute and talk about why am I talking about a house in a form that's about infrastructure. Um, the, reason, the reason for that is because this house works in a very different way than most houses in the way they're built today. It's, it's built more like the prairie so seeing the example earlier was, uh, is inspiring. Um, it, the prairie, which is uh, a, matrix, uh, a resilient matrix of individual organisms that in themselves are quite diverse and have the capacity to do things like uh, uh, absorb and store its own energy and water. So essentially being its own resource um, and, and being interactive with the environment Hmm, interesting. No, oh, technical difficulties. Uh, I was worried about this. You said this was a PDF? Yeah. I got two slides. <laughs> that was pretty good. Hmm. There, there it is. Shall we try to open up from there? There we have slides. Okay, let's. Okay, there we go. Okay, it's... If you give a round of applause, that's Maria. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. So, sorry about that. So, here's what we did. We, we got together uh, to build an uh, exhibition home on the Washington, D.C. Mall, which was visited by over 300,000 people. And then, when we were done, we moved that house to the neighborhood, the Deanwood neighborhood of um, Washington, D.C., which is 
east of the Anacosta River, and a neighborhood which is historically African American um, and you know very uh, resilient uh, community in itself. So um, when we got to that community, again, we didn't just build a house; we we worked uh, intimately with that community, and um, working with that community meant that we. Um, did build a house, but we also built a garden. And the two of those things uh, were essential to each other. So well, while in the house, uh, for the house, we built a garden that the homeowner could grow her own food. Uh, we also built a community garden where she could learn if needed and have the support she needed to grow that food. In addition, um, our, our house has, uh, is has solar panels on it. It's its only form of energy generation. And uh, the, our, our, our students as well created a solar co-op in the neighborhood that um, student, people could go to that garden again to learn about how they could group together to buy solar power in an affordable way. So it's, it's about the house, but it's also about the community. So in order to do this, we work together um, with uh, various organizations in the community. We worked first with the local a a ANC uh, commissioner, Sylvia Brown. We also worked for the with the Department of Housing and Community Development. And then we worked with a nonprofit organization called Habitat for Humanity, which I'm sure you all know of. Um, and, and we spent, a couple, uh, spent time learning about the community and learning uh, meeting and knowing the community. So Deanwood is, a, again, a very interesting community, historically African-American, and they think of themselves as being self-reliant. They've essentially had very little city services um, for their whole, their whole history, so they've needed to be uh, able to um, you know, help each other and, 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 again, think of themselves as self-reliant. Um, also, an interesting fact about Deanwood is uh, Lady Bird Johnson actually started the City Beautiful movement in Deanwood. Um, so we met many, many times with uh, various community members, creating a public events, um, picnics, etc., in order to really engage the community in, in conversation. And we worked with city government on multiple levels. Um, because what we were proposing, again, was, was different from what normally is done in building a house. So in addition to dealing with the design issues, we also had to deal with uh, um, speaking with uh, city officials and making sure they understood what we were doing and how it would function. Um, so the house ended up um, with uh, main, main concept, large porch. It's something that was very, con if it's a community has uh, federal style buildings throughout the neighborhood, uh, but the porch culture again is a very important part of, of DC. Um, and, but that porch, this drawing shows that the porch actually uh, was the, the entry into a house that went from urban um, quality to a natural uh, environment in the backyard. So um, the, as much as we were dealing with the house itself, we were also dealing with the landscape of the house. So um, that, that natural condition was essential to, to creating that um, analogy to the prairie. So um, the house doesn't, um, there's, it's a zero runoff house. No water goes away from the house, so it's not affecting the rainwater, stormwater systems. In addition, actually, we uh, did with through a layered approach to landscape design. We actually diverted some of the rainwater coming off the street through the site, so it slowed down the flow of that water. And this, uh, so that strip of land between your house and the sidewalk, um, that land is, is actually now a bioswale, and it, it exists as a um, model for Washington, D.C. If this works, which we have a three-year monitoring program in, in place, but if it works, they'll be able to um, use this throughout the city, and this will radically change the sewer system of, of Washington, D.C. Um, so we used uh, very, con very simple things, passive solar energy um, and, and human energy. 
Um, and we, we started with Passive first. So we worked with a technology called Passive House, uh, where we were able, with the building envelope itself, to reduce the loads of the building to 90%, 90% less than conventional houses. That meant we had to do all kinds of analysis with our engineering students, and it meant that we had to build very thick walls with lots of uh, beautiful recycled newspaper insulation. And we also uh, were very careful to design the windows well and uh, make sure that the solar energy was getting where it wanted to be and not overheating the house and that we had a beautifully daylit house that allowed the homeowners not to use electricity. Um, so coupled with that passive solar technique, we used a what we call a micro-mechanical system uh, that, that has some uh, synergetic relationships that we set up inside the house, again, allowing us to reduce the loads through the way that we use the machines in the house. Um, that meant that our house on the uh, solar decathlon lawn was the most affordable house. We, um, 250000 was the lowest cost of any of the houses. And we were able to, and one main reason is because our solar panels, we had the smallest array on the mall. Um, so the logistics of building this project were complicated. Uh, we started with the little thing in blue, which was the house on the mall. We uh, worked with Habitat for Humanity to have them add a second floor to that house, and then we added a whole other house next door. So what we built was a side-by-side -side, uh, uh, community house. And um, our students were learning how to, uh, part of our mission was an educational mission, so we, were, we made sure that all of our students whether they were urban planners or fashion designers, understood the kind of building technology or any other kind of technology that's in the house through actually building it. And you know, simultaneously while building the house, we were building the garden and uh, uh, again, trying to um, work the two together. We were organizing the solar co-op, we were working with city government, we were training Habitat for Humanity. So here's the, the house as it existed as the uh, model house on the Washington Mall, DC Mall, um, backyard where people gathered, side yard which begins to show some of the rainwater technology. Here's the house as it was being moved from the mall eight miles away to Deanwood. Um, the right hand side underneath there is where that double, the, the modules were moved in place and you see Habitat for Humanity of Washington DC taking on and building the rest. So essentially we were able to um, not just teach our students but also teach uh, Habitat for Humanity. Um, so we brought them up to our school, we put them through a two week training, uh, their executive director, their person who's the head of building, uh, building construction. And we made sure that, that when we left, they would be able to um, proceed on their own. Um, and as the building was being finished, the garden was being finished, um, we were very excited when Casey Trees uh, donated uh, the, these fruit trees, which became one of the first orchards to be replanted in Washington uh, along with this project. So here's the home as it was complete in December. Um, uh, that, that you know, sitting on that porch in the evening was an awesome experience, um, being able to uh, engage uh, community as they came by. Um, this is a little view of what the house looks like and the, in, and the sunlight streaming in. Um, this is a photo of Kia Kali and her three sons. Uh, they're the homeowners who are moving in to this house very shortly. Um, and one of the most important things uh, for us in terms of uh, the uh, reason or logic for, for uh, transforming again this affordable house um, into a solar house was f it really for the homeowner. So essentially what this allows is the homeowner, uh, typical houses of that equivalent size in, in the area uh, cost about 2300 a, uh, a year to um, power and so she's going to have no energy bills and the net present value of that is you know enormous for them as a, as a, as a family. Um, what, working with Habitat we, um, we uh, ended up uh, the cost of that building cost about 10 or 12 percent over what they actually build today even with the net zero 
um, cost, which we were very proud of. And again, we were really happy to have Lakia cut the ribbon and um, be getting ready to move in, especially because we're um, so happy to see what will happen to that next generation who can actually live in a house like this. And then the last thing to say about it is, um, in addition to Lakia and her sons, again, we're, the, the networked approach is expanded from this house, not just within the city, but also, uh, again, with our association with Habitat for Humanity. So now, Washington, D.C., Habitat is in the process of building six new homes of the equivalent of these two homes. Um, we're working with Habitat for Humanity in Philadelphia. We're designing seven new homes with them, of, uh, again, this equivalent. And the goal is to really change the way affordable housing is built in America, and through that, change um, our, 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 our way we, we deal with ecological building. Um, I do have, if, if I have one little clip from uh, uh, Lakia talking about our house. You want to hear it? It's like two seconds. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. No problem. We don't need to do that. But, Laura, i got to explain something about Rhode Island. There's sort of a quid pro quo going on in the state. And I invited you here. So, like, I'd like something. And that house would be just perfect. It, so we'll talk later, right? Because there'll be other forms. I just wanted to teach her something about the state and how it works a little bit sometime. Not really. I don't mean that. And out you to the TV. No, it's just a joke, Mr. Schilling. All right. Uh, when I started to do this kind of study, I ran across the Sustainable Cities blog, and each day as I subscribed to it, I'd wake up in the morning to these wonderful visionary photos of cities around the world that knew somehow how to combine uh, uh, sewage with parks, or gathered communities together around festivals, or created alternatives to the car. Um, and it taught me a great deal, and it opened my mind to all kinds of possibilities. So when we had a chance to do this forum, I really wanted to get the creator of that blog, Cade Benfield, to be here today. And he's the director of the Sustainable Communities and the editor of Sustainable Cities blog for the National Resource Defense Council in Washington, D.C. He co-founded LEED for Neighborhood Development, a national process for defining and certifying smart green land development under the auspices of the U.S. Green Building Council. His forthcoming ebook is People Habitat, 30 Ways to Think About Healthier and Greener Cities. Would you welcome uh, Kate Benfield to Rhode Island and to URI. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. It's, it's, th this is the kind of program that I really love and uh, that I really enjoy uh, being part of. It's my first time in Providence, and I'm very impressed, as I'm about to say in, uh, in the course of uh, presenting these slides. It's a big night for pillars, by the way. I want to <laughs> mention my, 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 my pillars. Uh, there are also pillars of wisdom, and there are all sorts of pillars if you want to research pillars. Uh, there are a couple of people in the audience that I want to recognize. Is Bill Dennis in the house, by chance? Well, I know Scott Wolf is in the house. Scott, could you raise? Yeah. Scott Wolf is uh, the CEO of GrowSmart Rhode Island, and if you do not know GrowSmart's work, you should. Uh, they have a very pragmatic approach to economic development, which builds upon the assets that Rhode Island has, and they're really one of the best groups in the country uh, at doing that. I uh, want to think about a sustainable community and the elements of a sustainable community across three scales of human habitat that I think are particularly important. You see the three scales represented here. The metropolitan region comes first. The metropolitan region is the scale at which our economy works. The economy doesn't respect political boundaries anymore. Neither does the environment, by the way. So it's also a scale at which the regional environment works. After the metropolitan region comes the city or municipality. 
Now the city, frankly, or municipality, is not terribly important to the environment because air and water doesn't respect municipal boundaries. But it's very important for getting things done because we don't have good ways of getting things done at the regional scale in this country with a few uh, rare exceptions. The third scale that I would point to is the neighborhood. If the metropolitan region represents the economic scale of human habitat, then the neighborhood represents the human scale. It's where we encounter our environment every day, and it's also where increments of new development take place. So it's where change occurs. It's the scale at which change occurs. So let's get to those eight pillars, if you will. Uh, I'm really kind of blown away that Ruben had, a, had pillars in his uh, slide. You know, it's, it's, it's going to be very distracting as I go through this whole thing here. Um, first one is to have a complete community. Anybody in the audience want to say what a complete community is? Okay, no takers. Well, a complete community is a community that has everything you need within the community. In Portland, they talk about a 20-minute neighborhood, meaning that everything in your daily life should be either a 20-minute walk or a 20-minute transit right away. You've got your school, you've got the places where you shop, you've got the uh, parks where you recreate, you've got your jobs, you've got your homes, everything is within reach and is in the same community. You don't have to leave one neighborhood to go to another or leave one community to go to another in order to accomplish your daily life. Now I noticed that when I put this uh, slideshow together, and I picked this particular image that it's got something that suspiciously looks like a regional mall to me. And another thing, it looks suspiciously like a Walmart. So I'm not sure I quite chose the perfect <laughs> image for my first pillar of a sustainable community. But be that as it may, we'll move along to transportation. Uh, transportation is terribly important to the shape of our environment, to the shape of our communities. Uh, to the shape of our metropolitan regions. So for a sustainable community, we want a transportation system with choices. We want to be able to go to places by walking, by bicycling, by transit, by driving. When we drive, we want to be able to drive short dis distances rather than long ones. So a community-oriented transportation system is very important. Green buildings. Uh, Laura had a lot to say about green buildings, and the images that you're uh, seeing here are from a project in British Columbia, which scored very high in our lead, lead for Neighborhood Development rating system. But I also want, particularly while I'm in Providence, to mention a different kind of green building, and that's a historic building. We don't necessarily think of a historic building as being green. But as Carl Elefante is fond of saying, the greenest building is the one that's already built. Because you don't have to expend the energy and extract the resources to build the new building. And I would submit that a historic building typically is green for another reason as well. And these were some reasons that Laura also alluded to, which is that before what my friend Steve calls the thermostat age, we had to build buildings in a certain way that was adapted to the climate, that were oriented properly, that had the right kinds of walls, that had the right heights of the ceilings, that had the right kinds of windows. A lot of historic buildings have those properties. Now, I walked around downtown Providence today. I was blown away by the treasure of historic resources that you have in your downtown. It, it's really extraordinary. New Orleans is the only other big city I can think of that has that kind of asset. And uh, I don't know if the state historic tax credit has been passed again or not, but if it hasn't, it, it should be. I mean, this, this is one of the most important assets in your community, and it needs to be conserved and maintained. Multitask open space, we saw a great example of that in Janet's uh, presentation, where you've got a green roof that filters rainwater 
that also presents culture of the prairie while serving as a performance space. That's a multitask open space. Now I'd like to draw your attention to the image within the center of the slide, which I think has a particularly good example. You're looking at a site plan uh, for a uh, uh, revitalization development in Richmond, California. Now notice that the green space is pretty much concentrated in that diagonal line that runs across the northeast corner uh, of the image. That green space does a lot of things. It's got little greenhouses there. It's got a swimming pool. It's got a community garden. But what you don't know, unless you saw a more complete map, is that it also buffers the community from the pollution of a freeway. So it's really an extraordinary design of how to use open space for more than one purpose. I can't give a better explanation of green infrastructure than Laura did. Uh, it's the way to go, and I'll just leave it at that. Uh, healthy food system. Uh, it's been really interesting to me how really just in the last five years how food became a city planning issue. Nobody was talking about food 10 years ago. Now everybody's talking about food. Everybody wants a community garden. Many places have community gardens. My favorite kinds of community gardens are small that fit into neighborhoods rather than displacing neighborhoods. In other words, large urban farms to me at some point aren't about cities anymore. But when they fit into the city fabric, then that's a good thing. Now, in addition to the gardens, stores that sell fresh produce. I know in uh, Washington, D.C., where I live, we've got a program to encourage uh, neighborhood stores. We need more neighborhood stores, for that matter, uh, to sell fresh produce to uh, alleviate what we call the food deserts, where you have neighborhoods where you have to go far away, farther than that 20-minute uh, neighborhood uh, marker in order to get fresh produce. Community facilities and programs. I'm not sure I can be Ruben's presentation on that one. <laughs> uh, but community facilities and programs are really important to a community. And I would add, this is not one of the uh, specific eight pillars. These eight pillars are not original to me, by the way. I adapted them and changed some of the wording. But they come from a fellow named Mark Holland, who I believe was the first sustainability director of Vancouver, a city that's known for sustainability. And he called them eight pillars of a healing city, which I think is an interesting concept. Uh, one of them, of course, is community facilities and programs. One that I would add that's not in his original eight would be art and culture. And of course, we've had a, a great discussion of, of, of art and culture uh, already. Another that I would add that's not explicit uh, is social equity. I think without social equity, you don't really have a sustainable community. And finally, economic development. And again, uh, this is where I believe here in Rhode Island, as uh, Scott's uh, organization, Grow Smart Rhode Island, uh, will uh, expand upon, if you go to his website, is you have great assets to build on for economic development. I know you need economic development, but walking around downtown today, I was really encouraged. Uh, I think this is a place that has uh, been through its hard times, but I think the next 10 years are going to be a time of increasing relevance uh, for Providence if you build upon the specific things uh, that you have now. The Healing Cities Institute has restated these eight principles in more general ways. I'm kind of nerdy, so I wanted to give you the specific ways first. But here are the more general ways. Whole communities, conscious mobility, meaning you can have a choice. Restorative architecture, I love that word and that phrase. It gives us a lot to chew upon. Thriving landscapes, integrated infrastructure, nourishing food systems, supportive society. That's another great, great phrase. Um, and healthy prosperity. 
Uh, my communications department is always happy when I plug my websites, uh, and I want to thank uh, Mark for plugging one of my websites. Uh, you can go to my blog, just with kbenfield.com. You can read about my book and read an excerpt of it by going to peoplehabitat.com. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Okay. So we're going to keep you about another 15 minutes, but we're going to change a bit of the program. Let me get this. And we'll keep the desks there. And why don't we now begin a conversation between ourselves and with our panelists. Scott, Scott, would you feel like coming up and having a seat there in case there's a question that you want to address or address you? Scott Wolf from Grow Smart, Rhode Island. Thank you, Scott. No, 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 up there. Take my chair. I'm not going to need it for a while. Thank you. Let me just get this out of here. Sorry. Marie. Sorry, Marie. Good. Thank you. Shush. Oh, I just heard it. So that, that reminds me of this Woody Allen joke I just heard. I think he was in Cairns and someone was photographing him and said, do you mind if I photograph you? He was eating dinner. And he said, no, 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 no. I like to be interrupted in the middle of dinner. <laughs> okay. So here's what I, how I want to do it now. We're in Luisa Aldea. We've had a few beers. We're hanging out. We're sitting there. The music's going in the jukebox. It's the end of a night. We've, you know, been hanging out. And we've just got sort of thinking about, like, how can we build community? How can we build uh, a, a community that has um, uh, multiple uses of transportation, that's uh, sustainable, et cetera, et cetera? You've just heard some conversation. I'm sure some ideas have come into your head, thoughts have come into your head. So let's get a conversation going between all of us, if we can. Questions, thoughts, any ideas out there? What do you think? Any criticisms, I, uh, questions, can this really happen, et cetera, et cetera? What do you think of what went on? Anybody think of anybody else's panel? Scott, what do you think in terms of Rhode Island? I, I, mean, I think we have all the elements here. Why don't you talk into this? Uh, yeah. Pass I think this we around. have all the, all the elements here to be a, you know, a first-class, sustainable city. And uh, we've got uh, diverse architecture. We've got um, a, a scale that's manageable. We have urban amenities without urban hassles, I would say, <laughs> to a large extent. Uh, we have great natural resources as well as physical, uh, you know, physical beauty in our architecture. And uh, I think what we need more of is, uh, is an appreciation of these assets and a, a positive attitude about our potential. You, you talk to a, a typical Rhode Islander and they think we're one of the worst places in America. And, uh, <laughs> And we're actually, we're one of the best, uh, but uh, in many ways. But our economy has not kept up with the, sort of our quality of place. And I think it's figuring out how to translate that quality of place into a thriving economy that's the, the sweet spot for Rhode Island's future. Mm -hmm. Everybody's shaking their heads. Yes. What did you think when you first got here? Ruben, what was your thoughts as you walk around? I think Providence is packing a punch, and it's ready to swing. You know, <laughs> in, in, in a good sense, you know, you, you got so many good things here in terms of the academics, in terms of the culture. Uh, you have world-class cuisine, you know, and I can, I'm a testament to that, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I, and I think all these things in the 21st century, I mean, it's a whole different place. You know, we are poised for progress because we have the intellectual capacity, we have the technology, and then we have the things that are closer to our hearts, which are the culture, the arts, the literature, uh, and then the combination of that with the space, we are a very compact city. It's an interesting, a, a interesting city to walk uh, around. So that particular combination uh, entices me, and I think people on the outside are looking at that. Uh, and that's where I think we can translate into, you know, creating jobs and uh, bringing in investment from other places in the world. So, how, how do cities work, or do cities care about diversity? 
their economic as well as, quote, and I always put these in quotes, national or uh, racial diversities. I always find this issue of gentrification particularly difficult when we do a lot of these kind of conversations. How do other cities, do other cities, I mean, do, I, I think diversity always gets, gets, uh, get some air time, but I don't get the sense that people really, really, really want to live with a multiplicity of, uh, of uh, nationalities and class and et cetera, et cetera. Cade, what do you think? Well, I think, uh, is this on? Yeah. yeah. I think cities better care about it, because uh, that's the future of America. And uh, in, in, unless uh, we uh, handle that with a plum, uh, we're not going to be successful. And I'm actually very optimistic. If you look at the younger generation, they, they don't have the same hang-ups that older generations have about differences in cultures and races. I, I, I think this problem is going to work itself out in another generation or two. Uh, a point about gentrification is such an explosive word that we're afraid to use it, I think. Uh, and it's, it's come to mean some things that I don't think it necessarily means. We have cities in the United States that desperately need some gentrification. Uh, I think that uh, it would be a nice problem for Detroit or St. Louis uh, or Buffalo, you know, right now to have. Uh, I think the trick for places like that is to have enough gentrification without having too much. I also think that there are places where we can have mixed income communities that are now low income communities. We can bring some higher income people in. But a lot of these places have been so badly disinvested that you can put the new people in new buildings that, on what are now vacant properties. So you don't necessarily have to displace people in order to do that. So I think there's a way to manage the mixing of incomes in a way that doesn't necessarily present the evils of gentrification along with it. I think you're talking about gentrification as a form of diversity. In a way, you want all mixes of people. It's not just one economic class, one social class. You want a mix of people wherever they are. And I think, Janet, your project to me was always intriguing because what you wanted to do, there's, you can obviously program that site up in the prairie to attract a certain kind of person, but there was an explicit element to that, what was going to be programmed up there, am I right? Um, yeah, we've, we've hired um, a, a performance curator named Lisa Cordes there, and really one of her main issues is bringing, um, Kansas City is quite segregated, and she wants to bring people from all over Kansas City to that space, so it is a, a big part of her agenda for it, yeah. Bringing, making it more diverse. And I was fascinated by what you were saying, Ruben, about the way in which Louisa obviously could be a place that would be more and more people would buy their homes and get summer homes there or something by the beach. But what you were saying that there's a network of community, of people that have been there for many, many generations, that somewhat because of that festival, they're able to develop some sort of economic base uh, from which to stand and to stay. And that's the whole point regarding, um, you know, community, a community that can last over time, you know, that they find their own particular niche in this universe. Because uh, in the particular case of Loisa, you know, next to Loisa, a couple miles west of Loisa, it's all San Juan. You know, it's a completely different dynamic with the large scale, you know, five star hotels and all that. But, uh, you know, if you want to go for that, you go ahead and they have their own community, Condado, which is a more sophisticated, cosmopolitan, you know, neighborhood kind of area. But then you have also Loisa, you know, just a couple miles east. So you get that flavor and that interest. So when you have find a community that can basically work with what it has, you know, and everybody pulling together, exciting things happen. Boy, it seemed like it was it's only a couple of miles. It seemed like it took forever to get back to the ship. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I don't even remember that either. I think the next day. Um, when you brought that house into that, that community, which seems 
wonderfully uh, extent, uh, existing and, and strong. What was the reaction of people uh, in the community? It, it was really interesting because, uh, you know, we often, we often think that people, our communities without resources uh, don't, don't uh, debate or think about um, the same, same kind of issues that people who have resources do. And, and the community, that community was incredibly engaged, intellectual, and interested in being progressive. You know, they didn't want, they didn't want um, something that was from, they wanted a new century. They were so excited about it. And they're not, it's not just that project. There are a few other projects that, that stimulate, again, that same. That, same that are offering so alternatives to affordability. Yeah, that, that within a community that doesn't have a lot of resources, you can still have a good life, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And certainly the community itself is still there. Kate, as you travel around the world, as you get all these blogs, what excites you mostly? Well, I, I suppose the cheap and self-serving answer would be to say forums like this. Where can <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, which, which really do excite me, by the way, because I, I run across people who care about these issues, and when I run across other people who, who share these concerns and share my enthusiasm for the solutions, that excites me more than anything else. Um, I, I mean, I mean, some. I, I think every city kind of has its own strengths that, that that appeal to us. You know, when you go to Barcelona, you think of their their tremendous walkability. When you go to New York, you think of the excitement. You know, when I came here, I thought of the historic buildings. You know, when I go to San Francisco, I think of those incredible views of the San Francisco <laughs> Bay. I mean, every city's got its own assets, and uh, I, I actually think that those of us who are in the business of making cities better need to be careful about being too formulaic about that. Uh, I, I think the last thing we want to do is to create a lot of places with the same attributes. I think it's really important to to stress the the differences in different places. Question? Yep. Here, here, you want to use this? Um, I think I can talk loud enough. Mm -hmm. I thought the presentations were very interesting, but I'm wondering how you see this fitting into Providence. Oh, okay. Why don't you repeat it for the uh, the millions that are watching on TV? How does this fit into Providence? What your presentation? Scott? I didn't make a presentation. <laughs> <laughs> but having listened to it, what did you think about it in terms of Providence? Oh, okay. How's that? Very good, huh? All right, fair Thank enough. you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I think um, one of our strengths in, in Providence, I think, is, is in a small footprint, we are a very diverse city and becoming increasingly so. And we we have an opportunity to use our cultural diversity and our artistic dynamism to really stand out as a, as a fun place both for residents and for visitors. And so I think, I think that kind of struck a responsive chord with me that looking at... I'd also like to give a plug for this. May 14th, right here, uh, where 195 used to be a community exploration. There's 35 acres there, and there's a lot of acres still downtown, which is to be developed, as well as different parts of the city. So these kind of ideas and these ways of thinking are completely adaptable for the, the issues, the problems, and the possibilities of Providence's uh, next generation. Do people plan to work with universities? Um, I suppose so. I would think so. I would hope so. I would hope the University of Rhode Island, located here and beginning to take this initiative as an urban uh, center, would become a center for this kind of thinking. One question. Uh, uh, Betsy, did you want to? Uh, well, I just wanted to know, I see Barnaby sitting here, who created probably one of the most successful art projects ever, and he's struggling. How, what are funding alternatives that we could tap into or... I mean, he, his, he meets all the criteria that everybody's identified, but we can't keep it funded. Barnaby, would you like to cry a little bit for all those? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't want to cry, but I, um, I really thought we captured a lot of very interesting things here. 
I mean, our challenge now is uh, part of the infrastructure support system where the river hasn't been dredged. So, um, but and this, I think Providence is quite interesting as we've tackled a number of very interesting solutions. We've preserved a tremendous amount of buildings. Kate, okay, you just talk about that. It's an extraordinary resource. Uh, I think everyone in the room supports the idea of keeping the, um, you know, the preservation tax credit that helps do that and it helps get over that leverage. But then there's always that challenge of preserving the infrastructure. So the challenge we're facing right now is the river hasn't been dredged. So it's, uh, but uh, I, I think it's a, it's a complicated mix. But I, I must say we've been very uh, appreciative of the support we've had from all parties. But there are always these little details that need to be worked out. And I, what I like about the community is we talk about them. We, we sit through and try to work through them. Um, I just have to continue I those think one thing that's, that's happening in, in Providence, and I don't think it's unique to us, but I think it's pretty pronounced here, is this is a city that for, for decades was built <clears throat> on manufacturing and on finance and on uh, uh, the private sector to a large extent. And now we're much more a city of meds and eds. That's become a cliche, but there's something to that. And so I think the, the old pillars of, the, to use that term, the old pillars of the community were the bankers and they were the, the heads of major industry. Well, we don't have those institutions at the same scale today that we had years ago. So what are emerging as the new leaders of the community are the leaders of our, of our meds and eds uh, to a large extent. And I don't think we fully integrated them into the leadership structure of the, of the community, but I think it's, it's happening and it just needs to accelerate. I think for those who didn't realize, who, do you want, who, 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 yeah, those who had net weren't here before the river was opened up and before um, water fire, before S220, before a lot of the organizations don't realize what it was like downtown and how vacant it was and how blank it was. It was like an empty chalkboard when you were, you know, in the middle of a summer in a school. And it's amazing, and I agree with Betsy, that the, and it probably is a question of the lack of funds, that uh, it's not lack of commitment, the amount of money that's brought into the city and the amount of vitality and the integration of a particular landscape and creating both a promenade and a place for contemplation should be funded, should be part of what the community funds. It should be exactly what we uh, spend money on. And I sympathize with, with, uh, with anybody that has to raise money out in the private sector continually for something that, that, that supports the public sector so well. Please, I, I can't reach out here, but if you could come up here and then we'll get to you and to Rick, yeah. I, I agree with you, Scott, that we have a very beautiful city and it's filled with tremendously talented people. I think we do are very fortunate to have the meds and eds people here in Rhode Island and in Providence in particular, but those people have the privilege of great tax advantages. And until they go to work in the private sector and then can pay us something, how do we get the income and the jobs to come here so that Providence, who has many universities and a great zoo and a great park, has the funding to, to pay for some of these people to come back into these beautiful buildings. Tremendous opportunities right now with those lovely buildings that you're talking about, Cade, that are vacant, because we have a strong rental market in Rhode Island currently. Many people can't afford a home. And it would be lovely to populate a community, take advantage of these new parks and sculptures and waterways that we're going to bring, and actually involve people in living here. But if they don't have jobs, they can't stay. Many people are actually joining together as families to survive. But how can we bring them to Providence? And what can we give them so that they can stain the personal taxes on their cars that are so high as opposed to elsewhere? Um, and for those that own property, extremely high property taxes. And again, our income tax in this country is tremendous in this state, is one of the highest in the country. So I don't know how you can address that. And I'm, I'm sorry, but between you and probably floor there. Maybe you can give me an idea. So, thank you. Scott, how do you solve the problem? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I think we have to put the problem in some perspective. Uh, and we actually, if you look at our uh, income taxes in Rhode Island, our sales taxes, and our property taxes, uh, the only one that's really out of whack with the national averages is our property tax. Our income tax, with some changes that have occurred over the last several years, is, is about middle of the road. 
Uh, our sales tax, high rate, 7%, but it's applied very narrowly. It's, it's a progressive sales tax, so, and we don't have local sales taxes. So you go to Denver, Colorado, which Colorado has a lower sales tax than Rhode Island, but the effective rate in Denver is like 10 or 11% versus 7% here. So there's some urban legends about how bad things are here. That I, I th and I, and I, I'm not saying they're wonderful in all cases, but there are, some of the problems we're facing are not by any means unique unique to us. And I think, though, we do have to play more effectively to our strengths. You know, we, we spent all this money guaranteeing a loan for 38 studios in, in the video gaming field, a field where Rhode Island had no track record. Why didn't we put a tenth of that money into our marine expertise? Why didn't we have a decent tourism promotional budget so we're not outspent by 20, 20 times by Massachusetts and Connecticut. Why don't we build on those kinds of strengths as opposed to chasing that, that kind of elusive uh, butterfly out there? And that's how we get ourselves behind the eight ball, is, is not believing enough in ourselves. When we get desperate, when, we, when the inf our inferiority complex gets the better of us, then we start doing stupid things. Yes, please. Hi, um, this, this question is actually more for Ruben than anyone else, but. Uh, Feel free to, to add. Um, just a question about how you incentivize people, investors mostly, uh, bigger corporations, to really uh, invest in like those, these green energy projects and these, you know, even when it comes down to, you said you had Coors Light and, you know, a couple of other companies investing in the, in the street festivals. How do you get people to, to do that? Like what is the plan to sort of incentivize investors and, and other companies to get on board with things like that, especially in the economics? sort of situation that we're in? Well, in my experience, I will tell you that uh, the way we, in which we uh, bring them uh, to the table is by educating them, uh, by basically, you know, um, opening up our minds to new approaches. Um, in Puerto Rico, we had a very difficult economic situation during my uh, time as planning director for the island. Uh, but we were uh, able to uh, work with the private sector and get uh, public-private um, partnership projects uh, in which we basically were able to make long-term concessions for the airport, uh, for school improvements, 63 schools that we uh, run through the program, and um, the PR222 uh, highway system. So it's, it's a understanding that Back in 2008, things changed, and we need to reposition ourselves and, and use the instruments that we have, economic instruments, fiscal, um, intellectual capacity, and capital, uh, and, and work with what we have. Like the panelists have mentioned before, we have world-class uh, education. We have world-class art. People know about this place, but we need to make it bigger in terms of, you know, making uh, the, the point that Providence has all these things uh, that if work together, we can actually start creating, you know, high paying jobs, innovation, and many other things will follow once we have that in place. So it's about, you know, making the case, you, you're in Facebook, you know, man, come to Providence, we have this and that and that, you know. It's about, it's about projection, but it needs to be a strategic projection. You know, what is it that people in Providence want their city to be? And the only way that we can talk about that is by sitting here and being honest and say, I think we need to do more with what we have. Let's that try. is my take. Let's take another question. Let's see, I had a couple of questions, but I think I'll ask you about, uh, this is sort of an economic com and community development question. I'm somewhat familiar with the, the Emerald Cities concept uh, in, in Providence, which is about retrofitting um, public buildings, I guess, maybe nonprofit uh, buildings as well, so that there's um, job creation for people who go into the buildings and do these energy retrofits, uh, as well as... Um, energy reduction in, in energy costs, which is a savings, particularly in public buildings, to the taxpayers, and then the overall benefit to the environment as well by, by using, le having less energy consumption. And I'm curious whether or not that is, to what extent that is part of 
the strategy either for Providence or in other cities that you're all familiar with? What opportunities might we have that we're not tapping into for this sort of double or triple bottom line type of uh, economic development and um, community development? <laughs> Kate, have you seen in ways in which we uh, can incentivize those kind of activities? There was a federal program called PACE, right? I forget what the acronym stood for, but it was for retrofitting residences, as I recall, that collapsed, uh, unfortunately. Um, I, I think that retrofitting older properties, uh, particularly for uh, multifamily housing uh, and commercial buildings, older commercial buildings, it's kind of on the cutting edge of uh, green thinking right now. So uh, I know that at, at NRDC, we've just started a very large commitment of uh, about 20 people uh, to be involved in 10 cities in the country to do pilot programs to do exactly that and hopefully create some jobs in those places. I mean, we're not going to install the things, you know, we're going to, we're going to help design and plan them. Um, but I, I don't think it's mainstream yet. I, I, think, I think it's the cutting edge. Uh, I think one of the unfortunate things about this particular decade uh, or so is that the amount of money that we have to do good things is not what, not the amount of money that we need to do good things whether that's from the private sector or whether that's from taxes going into the, the public sector or whatever the source is. So it's a real challenge. I, I, I think that's going to happen in a lot of places around the country, and I do think it's going to help with green jobs, and I think it's going to certainly help with uh, the environment and with the uh, amount of utility bills that people have to pay. Uh, but I think it's going to take longer than I wish. That's kind of my sense about it. I hope I have enough time to see it. <laughs> Laura, did you want to comment on that? You look like you're interested. I wanted to add a little bit to this discussion. I, I, um, I, I, think, uh, I think there are a lot of generous people out there. And we've, we experienced that. And you've experienced that. And people want change. They're, will, they, they're ready to make that change. And they need something that can catalyze their efforts. So it's not just public-private. Mm -hmm. It is also how institutions can work together, catalyze around Im important events that, that can draw individuals, those generous individuals, to, to the project. And indeed, they're paying you to do your artwork. <laughs> yeah, there is still money available to try make an effort to, and for better or worse, place make, I guess. Uh -huh. What do you mean better or worse? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure what your question is, Mark. Well, the question is really that there is some money out there in different places. If they want something badly enough, there is allocations available, not the, to the extent to which we would like the allocations. To well, you know, the 1% the for our programs, it's often a half of a percent of a public project that goes to art. So it's a really yeah. tiny amount of money for art although Happy Day thought it was a lot. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, that, those people see public art, they notice it, whereas, and they think they can do something about it, whereas they don't notice, they see architecture, but they don't think they can do something about it. They, they don't see um, all the issues that Kate is talking about. Um, it's not something necessarily that people think they can do something about. So the larger money needs to go towards those kinds of efforts, obviously. The, the public art money is a little tiny. Infrastructural bit. work, yeah. We're going to take three more, and then we're going to let everybody go. There's uh, one, and then back there two, and then three. Hi, thank you so much for being here. This is wonderful. Um, I just wanted to, I have not really a question, but I just wanted to point out that in addition to our world-class culture and architecture and all of that, Rhode Island has one of the highest percentages of older adults in the nation. In fact, I believe we also have the, the largest population of 85 and older. So as we transform our communities, I want to make sure that 
older adults are, are factored into that um, in terms of housing and contribution to society and, and not sort of warehoused. So um, we, we brought Tim Carpenter um, to campus a couple of weeks ago. He founded the Engage Communities in California and they're senior housing uh, for lower income older adults and moderate income built around arts and as I was listening to you talk uh, it would be wonderful to, to bring those communities here but also to make them sustainable so I just want to put in a plug for um, involving older adults in communities because they have a lot to contribute um, so. I'll make uh, one comment on that. Thank you want to just a follow up on that quickly? Yeah, Th thanks very much for that plug for me, thank you. Yes, <laughs> and handing the mic to me. Um, Yes, um, the contribution of the elderly is so important here, and we do have one of the highest percentages of elderly uh, people in the United States. What we also have, um, as a resident of Providence and Pawtucket, is an almost insurmountable problem, I believe, in our lack of transportation, our lack of public transportation. Um, it is apparently something that the legislature is unwilling to address. Uh, Mr. Marzan, I would appreciate your comments on how you expect to advise the mayor of Providence in his planning attempts around public transportation. We have a situation where public transportation is funded by the gas tax, which is fluctuating and insufficient, and it surely must be a matter of policy that public transportation has not been adequately funded. We the can't bring people out to, drive to the streets. More, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pardon me? You said you drive more to make more money. For exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Well, the little that I would say regarding that is that um, transportation alternatives to transportation, the, the multimodal options, are addressed uh, as part of the mayor's uh, putting Providence back to work program. And we are working with Ripton, the different partners at the state level, in order to make that a reality. Um, regarding gas tax and all those things, I mean, the federal government decided a couple decades ago that they wanted to incentivize, um, you know, private vehicles for travel. Uh, now, you know, 40 something years later, they decided to basically re revert that policy and provide money for mass transit systems. And, you know, with the, with the um, sequester on the economic crunch that we have suffered, you know, it's taken a little bit longer than we all expected. And I suspect that the solution will be between the federal government, the private sector, and folks on the policy side, you know, recognizing the needs out there. You know, we have a significant portion of our uh, community uh, consisting of uh, elderly cohorts that will need, you know, different modes of transportation. So, you know, things are getting together regarding that and we are making our part by working with, uh, the, with the partners to get the uh, multimodal transportation for real here in Providence, so. If, if I could add to that, uh our organization and 50 other organizations in the state are part of a group called the Coalition for Transportation Choices. And we have a bill that we're pushing, the O'Grady Bill, uh, named after Jay O'Grady, a state rep from Pawtucket and Lincoln, uh, that would start to provide more non-gas tax funding for public transportation. And there's going to be a rally about that and within the next week or so. Uh, it's got some legs. It's got a real chance. It's not a panacea, but it's a step uh, in the right direction. Stay tuned. Can't 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 tra can't be totally transformative overnight. Huh? Two more questions quickly. Hi, I wanted to um, ask the ladies at the panel. There's one that could do wonders with things that other people would throw away, and the other one would make a house that would be self-sufficient. Can we get that here? Because the economy is so bad here, and we have so many houses that have been boarded up that if we could have you guys do something, it would be wonderful. Laura, are you thinking of doing anything here while you're in Rhode Island? Oh, yeah. Huh? Oh, yeah. She is, all right. <laughs> will we, when will we hear about it? <laughs> Soon? 
Soon, okay. Oh, quickly, one more question, quickly. But before I go, right here, David Wells, that's a whole other side of the economy. He's uh, doing a art show over at Yellow uh, uh, Silk, Yellow Peril, Yellow Peril uh, over uh, next to the um, um, Cuban Revolution. Great gallery has pictures from people's houses who've been uh, uh, foreclosed upon. My wife also over there, she's the curator of it. Also, I like, yeah, it's a great exhibit if you've never seen it. Also, just quickly, another plug, Michelle, where's Michelle? She's here on May 1st. There's going to be uh, Urban Immersion Students Media and Civic Engagement here May 1st. It's her Media and Civic Engagement class, correct? Okay, good. And also, I invite you all to come May 14th to where 195 used to be a community exploration. It'll be right here. It'll be with Bert Krinka, Bonnie Nickerson, uh, Director of Long Range Planning for the City of Providence, Colin Kane, founding partner of Paragon Group, uh, and also the head of the uh, Redevelopment Commission, Mike McCormick, who's the head of uh, construction for Brown University, our own Marshall Feldman, Michael uh, Le Van Leesten, and uh, Mark Levine will be talking earlier at 4 o'clock on the whole issue of a knowledge district and the relationship of universities to economic development. Uh, Marshall, why don't you end us short, really give us short, I'll call it. Yep. <laughs> Mark knows me too well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, I, I want, you know, uh, I'm, I'm actually uh, going to answer this because of what Mark said, that uh, a few years ago we had a uh, symposium here, and I didn't ask a question that I've regretted not asking for the last couple of years, so I'm going to ask it now to you guys. Um, Kate, you mentioned uh, food deserts. I'm gonna, actually going to take three cracks at this question. Kate, you, you mentioned food deserts, and I've got a book upstairs by a guy named Neil Wrigley, who uh, is an economic geographer that reinvented uh, the geography of retailing in the 1970s. And in the beginning of his book, he talks about how in the late 60s, early 70s, he was studying food deserts, and he realized that in order to understand food deserts, he had, had to study multinational capitalism in the food industry and how uh, businesses, you know, international supermarket chains, used space as a competitive weapon, and that's how uh, we now have, when you talk about the geography of retailing, we understand the relationship between uh, coffee farmers in Kenya and Starbucks, and we understand how these things all link together. Um, so that, that's, that's one pass at this. The, the second pass at this uh, comes from, um, well, uh, hold on a second. Oh yeah, the second, Mark mentioned gentrification. And, you know, it seems to me there's an enormous difference in gentrification when we talk about the 1%, 99%. You know, by, by definition, there's always a 1%. Uh, but over the last 40 years in this country, the problem is that the 1%, except for a brief period of the late 1990s, has gotten essentially all increases in national wealth. 100% of national wealth has gone to the 1%. Okay. The, the, or so that's, that's the last. The last part of this question is that when I was a, a student in California in the early 70s, they passed a law requiring environmental impact statements for all developments. And we took that deliberately. We took the social and economic um, impacts as well as, the, as part of the environment. And so we would look at these kinds of things and we would often advocate for uh, poorer communities as to how their uh, equity issues were not being addressed. So my, my question to all of you is to look at what you're doing and ask, have you thought about these kinds of things? For example, how things are financed and wh whether or not they lead to uh, more upward mobility or more inequality and those kinds of things. And how does that, does that fit into the sort of things we've discussed tonight? Thanks, perfect. You guys think about anything? <laughs> any, is any, I guess the issue really that he's talking about, and, and you to correct me if I'm wrong, is that there's global consequences to every every uh, local action. And there's very, sometimes very little way of thinking of local unless we understand the global implications. And I'm assuming those kind of things you do think about and are aware of that. Am I, Scott, why don't you address that if you would? I mean, ab absolutely. Yeah. And we, I, I've, I've said for years that growth isn't smart if it benefits only the few and not the many. That's not smart growth. Smart growth is equitable growth. And easier said than done, no question about that. But by concentrating on things like expanding access to public transportation, uh, having more access to good food in our, in our inner cities, those are all ways to, to bring the, the bounty of America to, to more people. Uh, and to make, you know, I, I don't think a community is more livable if it's only livable for 1%. Uh, 
uh, that's not a livable community. So and I, I think I think you sort of have to start with that bedrock principle and build on it. I think as you say that, as we bring this to a close, what I've learned from this whole process and, and, and addressing what you said, Marshall, is that that I think we're entering a new way of looking at planning. Planning before was like, in some ways, sometimes, you know, you build a big road here for the purposes of cars, and you neglect what it does to a community. Or you perhaps uh, build a big box in the middle of a garden, and you don't consider what the recreational facilities are, or the ideas of where the rainwater is going. To me, what seems to be happening, and what I'm gathering from this conversation, is that there's a paradigm shift in the way in which people are looking at the world, that it's become one more of a systemic way of looking at the world, an organic, for lack of a better world, way of looking at the world, where no one can do one thing without recognizing what the implications are on a vast network of other things. And what I get from all of you and your work is that you're working from that premise. Am I correct? And, and, and I think the more we hear that, the more we understand the creative potential of urban, uh, urban life throughout the world, the more we recognize that you can't claim that you want to uh, uh, work for people's health and good education without providing a walkway to get to school. So that it's a continual dialectic and interaction that I think we're beginning to see. Hopefully it will reach a critical mass that will get the funding that indeed it deserves and indeed we all, all we need. Um, Janet Zweig, thank you. Wonderful to see you again after high school. <laughs> Ruben Flores Marzan, I'm really happy that you are a planner. I feel in good hands. And I'm waiting to see what dance you're going to build our economic development on, because I want to be the first person in line. Uh, Laura Briggs, I do want that house. <laughs> and Kate, I thank you very much for my morning optimism. By looking at your blog, it makes me always feel uh, uh, like there's possibilities in the world, and I thank you for that. And Scott, it, you know, it's not every day I could get such a person to just come up, sit on there, and add to the conversation. I thank you very much. <laughs> and to all of you who have stayed with us and participated and asked questions and uh, given me your smiles and laughs occasionally, I thank you. And how many are coming the 14th? Oh, wonderful. Okay. How many are going to tell other people to come the 14th? Oh, it's great. Okay. Thank you. See you soon. Bye-bye.